All right, so I want to uh, first thank you all for coming. And um, uh, the, the audience is quite uh, diverse. In particular, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I see many uh, experimentalists. All right, so the first, why do we talk about beyond the standard model? There is a list of open questions to which uh, the standard model of particle physics cannot uh, answer. And these, uh, these I put here in three different categories. The first category has to do with some structural uh, issues, mathematical issues of the standard model. For example, the hierarchy problem, why, why the Higgs is so light? or the flavor puzzle, why the, the, the masses of the fermions have such a funny uh, structure, why those numbers are so uh, hierarchical in the quark sector and uh, anarchic in the neutrino. Um, the strong CP problem, why we don't see, for example, neutron EDM, why this, this number is so small, um, and charge quantization. We see some hints of, uh, of, of the, which certainly point towards something in the at high energies. So the, the second class are observational evidence that the standard model is not the, 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 the entire story. And these come from basically, well, cosmology, modulo neutrino masses, which, which also we do in the laboratories. So for example, there is dark matter, uh, standard model cannot doesn't have a candidate for it, the candidate particle. Then there is matter antimatter asymmetry, which is too big. Um, the number observed is too big from one expected uh, in the standard model. And of course, neutrino masses. Uh, there's also um, large evidence for inflation that took place in the early in the early universe. And there are then there are more exotic stuff and probably even at, uh, you know, at uh, shorter distances, for example, dark energy, quantum gravity, et cetera. So we definitely need to study beyond the standard model. However, um, the standard model is, is, is very good. It's, it's, it's unbelievably good. For example, at this plot, you can see the prediction for different cross sections at the LHC for many different processes in the electroweak top and Higgs sector. And there are here, there is just, this is just a small subset of things that have been measured at the LHC and predicted from the standard model. You can see that these predictions agree with the experiment um, across many orders of magnitude in the cross section. So there is a great triumph of the standard model at the LHC. No, not only that, from these measurements, we can uh, learn, really learn some things about the nature at the electroweak scale. For example, measuring the Higgs couplings, which agree with the standard model prediction, we learned that the, that the standard model picture of electroweak symmetry breaking is definitely a good um, first order approximation to, 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 the, to the true story. Um, we hope it's not the, the, the entire thing, but it definitely looks like a good, uh, a good description. So there, so the electric symmetry breaking seems to be as uh, predicted in the standard model with the, with the Higgs being the part of the doublet, which we call the linear realization of electric symmetry breaking. But on the other hand, direct searches for new physics have failed to, to find new particles. On this plot, you can see the compilation of the limits um, for some heavy hy hypothetical new particles from example, supersymmetry. And this is also just a small subset of things that experiments uh, at Atlas and CMS have done so far. They're doing really a fantastic, uh, fantastic job. And they have, they didn't find any new uh, resonance, which also suggests a mass gap between new physics 
and the standard model. When I say a mass gap, I mean that the, 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 the new particles are, are heavier than the standard model particles from the theories that we expected or uh, have in mind. Um, and that there is some hierarchy between, between this, these two. So this experimental situation is uh, really uh, reinforcing the picture of an effective field theory. And this, I think, is why I chose to put effective field theory as the first lecture in the course beyond the standard model. Um, we are really pushed to this direction by the experiments. So the, the thing which is central to, to beyond the standard model is the so-called standard model effective field theory. And the, the picture that we have in mind is that um, it's shown that in this, this plot on the, on the right hand side. So we would like to, the, the, the space of, of, of these new theories beyond the standard model is huge. It's basically infinite. Everyone can write down his own uh, or her own preferred model. Um, however, uh, and, and this I called ultraviolet or short distance or high energy. However, the, the, the EFT, the effective field theories will give me an organizing principle. And if I'm looking at um, phenomena at the, at the low energies, then I can capture the effects of these things uh, into one framework, into one theory at low energies, it, low energy or infrared. And this is the standard model effective field theory. All right, so um, how do we discriminate between different models? So we are studying the, these Wilson coefficients, uh, which are marked with CI, and the, 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 the structure of the underlying model the dynamics and symmetries will basically manifest itself as relations between different Wilson coefficients. <clears throat> All right, so th there are many heavy words on this slide. And I will try in the next, uh, um, in the, at the end of this lecture, I will try to, to, to explain, um, starting from basics, what I mean by this slide, which I think is the crucial to, to it, it is basically the big picture. <clears throat> So my, my, my lectures are drawn from these and uh, from several lecture notes, which I uh, suggest you to have a look at. In particular, the first one is it's, it's very nice and detailed from the University of Zurich. <clears throat> all right, so, the, so what is an effective theory? So first of all, physics is the art of approximation. So the physics is all about approximation to understanding what are leading effects, subleading effects, etc. Um, so, for example, if you are looking at the, at the the phenomena of apple falling from a tree, the the theory which does a pr pretty good job for you would be uh, to have a linear gravitational potential. This is the effective theory of the Newtonian gravity, which has the 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 one over r potential. Uh, but, but the corrections that come from this more complete theory are uh, of the order of um, age over R, which perhaps is not relevant at the level of precision that you work it. And the Newtonian gravity is the, just the effective theory of a more general, more complete theory con called general relativity, which introduces even further subtle effects that you perhaps do, don't get. So, so, so the, the, the effective theory approximates a more complete theory in some limit. Um, it's very useful because you, you identify what are the relevant things for your problem, for your phenomena. And uh, it's, it really is the way we, 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 we think about and we understand the physics. We are trying to separate stuff. Um, so the key concept is the scale separation. For example, here age, the, 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 the height from which, which the apple falls is much smaller, that that scale is much smaller than, for example, the radius of the earth. <clears throat> In other words, a uh, very provocative sentence, we do not need quantum gravity to build a bridge. 
So effective theories are really central to physics. So let's go to field theories. So what is an effective field theory? Um, the, the, the motivation behind it is that um, we do not need to know the short distance quantum field theory to be able to compute long distance quantities with high precision. Okay. Uh, so effective theory, effective field theories are quantum field theories, but are less general by construction. They focus on an isolated region for which they are deliberately designed compared to a more complete theory. Effects from other regions are included as perturbations in a well-defined and systematic way. And this is really the advantage of the, the, the theory that you can really um, systematically organize the, the, the so you can, you can, you have a perturbation and you have a systematic way to, to organize, organize the things. So for example, um, <clears throat> imagine there is some large energy scale M and you want to compute, um, you want to compute and, and the energy in your process, the, the momenta of your particles, for example, P is much smaller than M. So the effective theory, um, you, can, you can build effective theory based on this ratio of P over M. And you can do the expansion when you calculate your quantity, you can do expansion uh, in, in this quantity, in this parameter, in this ratio. So what are the basic ingredients of an effective field theory? Uh, the first thing is this power counting. And it's basically to identify the scale separation in, in your problem. So to identify this uh, parameter in which you are expanding in. Uh, this power counting is important because when, when you make the expansion, you're, you're doing some perturbation, you will have an infinite series. And then you will be able to identify the terms in the series to, to power count the different terms and to, to, to identify how the, the importance of of an individual term. The, the, the second ingredient is um, the degree of freedom. So the, the degree of freedom of an EFT are basically fields, fields, so the quantum fields that you use to, to, um, to write down the effective Lagrangian. So the building blocks of which the effective Lagrangian is pieced together. <clears throat> so, for example, in your you are, you are dropping the, the heavy modes and you are keeping down the light modes. And this heavy and light in, a, in effective theory is defined by the thing which is called the cutoff. The cutoff is actually um, is is actually one of the inputs of an effective theory. We, we defines the, the, the effective theory. So there's a question by Hordi. Um, if I understand exactly, every theory is an effective theory and all theories have limited applications. Therefore, in such a thing as a complete theory, which is not an EFT, if so how do we distinguish an EFT from a non-EFT? This, this, this really is the, I, I will come to this point. In the end, I will conclude that every, every theory is an effective theory, uh, indeed. Uh, and I will, I will connect it to renormalization and it will be clear that every theory is an effective theory. Um, so the, the, the um, uh, more correctly, more precisely would be to use the term effective theory and more complete theory. So, yeah. So when I say a complete theory or full theory, I, I mean more complete uh, than, than the effective theory. All right. So the third piece of the, of, of the, 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 the third basic ingredient of an effective theory are symmetries. So we know in quantum field theory that we have space-time, gauge symmetries, internal symmetries, etc. And the symmetries are the rules how you glue different degrees of freedom or fields, how you glue them together to build operators. And here we talk about the local operators, meaning that each field uh, depends on exactly the same space-time point. 
uh, for the examples that we, we, are, we, we are focused here. <clears throat> So these are the three basic building blocks of an, an effective theory. Well, so you, you need to have a power counting, you need to define your degrees of freedom, and you need to define your, with a cutoff, um, and you, you need to define the, the symmetries. And then you are able to write down the, the, the Lagrangian of your theory. All right, so um, the important concept is matching. And matching means uh, connecting the, the UV theory to an effective theory. So on this uh, diagram, you can see, on this picture, you can see um, the, 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 the axis which represents the energy, mu, energy scale, okay? The cutoff is the thing that, that separates kind of um, the effective theory and the, and the UV theory. And the matching is the condition on the Wilson coefficients of an effective theory. Wilson coefficients are the couplings of effective theory. Um, the connection between them and the couplings of the UV theory. So in other words, the UV theory and the EFT must agree at low energies. Okay. So, so that is the that is the point. It's like the, the linear gravity potential and the Newtonian gravity. When you go to small uh, heights, they should agree. Okay, that there is this limit where they should uh, they should agree. However, at high energies, they disagree uh, completely. For example, at high energies, you can produce on shell um, heavy particles which don't even exist in the in the in the low energy effective theory. So you can have some additional processes and that additional uh, amplitudes which do not even exist um, in an EFT. Also the, also the processes in an EFT which you have, they are at very high energies, they are very different in, in, in an EFT and in the UV, <clears throat> okay? So th th there are these interesting uh, terminology in the literature. For example, things that are connected to the to high energies are are called ultraviolet, short distance, or hard. And the things that are connected to low energies are the terminology is infrared, long distance, soft. Okay, just just to keep this in mind. Uh, one technical detail: if there are two different methods to do the matching procedure. And we can do it diagrammatically and background field. And on the, in the second lecture, we will do, we will do one, one explicit calculation of diagrammatic uh, matching. All right. So here is one example of matching. Uh, there is, this is a three level um, example. So for example, you, let, let's say you are colliding light fields, phi, and uh, that you're producing two phi, so some kind of uh, diagram like this, and you are exchanging a heavy mediator with mass m. And the lambdas are the coupling, okay? So if you are doing these collisions, this scattering at very, at low energies, so the, the center of mass energy, for instance, much smaller than the mass of the heavy guy uh, in, in, that, that is in exchanged. Then this interaction, this diagram shrinks to a, to a local interaction. So we say that we, uh, this is matching. So we are integrating out heavy field. So what happens? So you have the propagator. So this is the formula for the propagator. And this is the, 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 the propag so the, the, the position space and the momentum space, the Fourier transform to, to uh, the Fourier transform, and you get the, this I K square over M square. Now, when K square, which is of the order of the center of mass energy is much smaller than M square, then you can expand this. Um, I hope you can see, can you see when I'm pointing stuff? Yes. All right. 
So you can do the expansion of the propagator in momentum space and the leading term is just constant. It does not depend on the, um, uh, on the energy. So this, this interaction will basically be the coupling square over mass square. So this is a local interaction and intuitively what happens is that, so when you are exchanging this heavy particle and you are working at, at, um, at very low energies, meaning you know, the, the, the wavelengths of your, um, of, your, of your real particles that come into interaction and, and, and get out are much bigger than the Compton wavelength of this um, heavy particle that is exchanged. So th this thing is, um, is local. Or, or mathematically, you can see it by, um, so, so if you put k squared to zero, and this integral is just a delta function of, of x. So the matching is that the Wilson coefficients of this local operator uh, is expressed in terms of the coupling and the mass in the complete theory. That's the matching, okay. All right, so there are uh, two types of effective theories. Um, one which go top down. Uh, in top down effective theories, we um, have the, we know the, the, the more complete theory, the UV theory. And um, uh, so how, however, we, we are focusing on the phenomena at low energies and we, we uh, calculating in, in the complete theory is an overkill. And it, sometimes it's even, um, sometimes you even have problems with perturbation theory. So you can, you, sometimes you cannot have a reliable uh, calculations. So you simplify your life, you construct an effective theory. For example, Fermi theory, or what we call weak effective theory, so four Fermi interactions, is uh, an effective theory of the standard model electroweak interactions. So we know the standard model, um, and we can integrate out heavy fields, for example, W and Z, and we can construct an effective theory, which is weak effective theory. Other examples are heavy quark effective theory and uh, uh, soft collinear effective theory. These are useful tools to, to, to have, um, um, to do calculations, even, uh, so, so even though you know the, the complete theory. And the second class are bottom-up effective theories. where we do not know the full theory. Uh, so we construct an effective theory by deciding on the degrees of freedom, power counting and symmetries and simply down all, write down all possible operators in, in accordance with symmetries up to a desired order in power counting with un, undetermined couplings. So here we don't know the full theory, uh, but we know the, these ingredients. So we know the, the, the the light degrees of freedom, the symmetries, and we just write down, we have there is power counting and we just down, write down all the couplings and, and um, we, which are at this level three parameter. And we use this to confront with the experiment. The example of this is standard model effective field theory. We don't know the BSM at the moment. What is BSM at the moment? or something which is called chiral perturbation theory applied to some strongly interacting uh, dynamics. All right, so at this slide, I want to give a little bit more uh, formal um, recap of what I just said. So how, how do we, um, in, in quantum field theory, how do we arrive to, to effective theory? So we first split the fields on hard and soft based on the cutoff. Then we integrate out the hard modes. So that there is a path integral over the hard modes of the exponent of the action of the full theory. And what we get is called the Wilsonian effective action, this S, S lambda. And then the effective theory is defined by this generating functional, um, which is the integral over the, the path integral over the light fields 
of the Wilsonian effective action and the source term. And then all correlation functions in an effective theory um, follow from these derivatives of the generating functional over the light fields for, for the light fields. However, the, this effective action is a funny object. Um, it, 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 it encodes non-localities. Okay, so the, the, the non-localities at the scale, so we have integrated hard modes. So the, in the position space, these non-localities are the in, of the order of the inverse of the hard scale or the cutoff. So you can do um, an, an, an expansion to get an infinite series for small delta x. So, so, uh, so basically then you can, you arrive to this infinite uh, uh, effective Lagrangian. And this, in, this uh, effective Lagrangian contains, um, okay, so it's an infinite series. Um, so there, are, there is a product of the Wilson coefficients and the operators. So the Wilson coefficients, they contain the inform information about the, hard, uh, about the hard modes that were integrated out, uh, out from, the, from the, at short distances. And here, for example, there are NK operators of the same dimension. We say the dimension of, of operator is something which is related to this uh, um, importance of different terms in the in the series to, to power counting. Okay. This was just a quick formal uh, recap. <clears throat> All right. So let me give um, a toy example of 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 of. Uh, of um, uh, a toy example of a full theory matched to the to an effective theory uh, to, to, to show some points some interesting points so here i will choose um a full theory to be uh, to be a theory of two interacting scalar fields so capital phi is the heavy field with mass capital m and lowercase phi is the the, the light scalar field with, with the lowercase m. So the first part of the, so these first four terms are just the free, uh, the, the free, uh, inter free Lagrangian, non-interacting uh, pieces. And then the last term represent interactions. So lambda phi to the four is the interaction between four, um, is the coupling between four light fields and then there is this G phi cube phi. This is the interaction between a heavy field and a light field and three light fields. So we will assume that uh, capital M is much bigger than, than, than uh, small m, okay? And we will consider low energy processes where the energy of the in the interaction is much small. It is comparable to, to, to small m, but it's much smaller than the capital M, okay? So what happens? So you know that the field, um, when, when you act with the field on, on, on vacuum, uh, you create particle, particle excitation. So think about the, the, the Fox space um, uh, annihilation and creation operators. So the, for the light field, you can create on-shell particle excitation. What does it mean? So this particle, the, the, for, the, for the light field, there is enough energy to have this particle in the initial and final state, to have it real, or, or, or perhaps uh, if it's decaying, to be a resonance, et cetera. However, this is not the case for the heavy field. The, the, the excitations, of the heavy field, the quantum excitations or particles are not kinematically accessible as real, okay? So what does this mean? So in, in an effective theory, we do not have to keep the, the heavy field. We can just drop it uh, away um, because the, the, you will not look at the scatterings of its, of it excit of its excitations, right? So we only have the, the light field phi 
However, the difference with respect to the to the full theory is that there is additional there is additional terms in the Lagrangian. These additional terms are built out of pi. The leading one is phi to the six, okay? And there is the suppression in the powers of inverse M, which we attribute again to this uh, propagator of the, of the thing that we integrated out. So this, is, so this is the full theory, this is the effective theory. So let me now uh, answer this question. Why do we need an effective theory when we can simply compute amplitudes in the full theory? Okay. So why do we need top-down effective field theories? All right, so, and it's a really, it's a technical thing about calculation. So let's say you are doing this calculate, this loop calculation. Here you have, um, uh, you are ex in the loop, you have two light fields and one heavy field. And when you do this loop calculation, you get the logarithm of the ratio of light mass over heavy mass squared. After you finish this loop calculation, and why can why why is this a problem? So, for imagine that you have extreme uh, scale separation, that the small m is extremely much smaller than than the, the than the capital M. Then that logarithm is is very big. Okay. So the perturbations, in fact, the perturbation, perturbative expansion is, is controlled not by the coupling, the perturbatively small coupling, but actually the product of the coupling and the logarithm. And if the coupling is not small enough compared to, the, to how big the logarithm is, then you, you are expanding, your, your expansion parameter is not small. And then uh, you are likely outside of the radius of convergence for your infinite series. So you have the breakdown perturbative calculation. You cannot trust your um, calculation. And the EFT matching and running is a way out of this disaster. Okay. So when you do this calculation in the EFT, you don't have the propagators of the heavy particles, right? You just have the light particles. So you don't get the logs of this, um, um, you don't get the log of the ratio. However, you get the divergence. You get the divergence. The, the, the effective field theory will produce more divergence than the UV theory. Um, Remember, in the UV theory, we, the, the, the loop was finite, but here it's divergent. So how do we understand um, this ultraviolet divergence? Um, the origin of it is from the regions in the integration where the vir virtual modes become hard enough to probe the non-locality of the effective vertex. So you see that in, in loop calculations, you have the integrals over these um, different modes in momentum space. And the modes, the big, the big ones for big L square going to, in, to infinity, they, they are hard modes actually. And they, uh, they virtuality of these modes becomes hard enough to, pr to probe the, 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 the non-locality of effective theory. What does it mean? Oh, sorry, of the effective vertex. What does it mean? Well, so we are pushing our effective theory to regions where it's not valid anymore. Okay, EFT breaks at high energies. So you see that the, the appearance of the divergence and the breakdown of the EFT are connected to each other. And, the, and, and you, you, I'm pretty sure you know uh, about renormalization renormalization is about these divergences in loop diagrams, UV divergences, loop diagrams. So the, the concept of an effective field theory and renormalization are closely connected to each other. In fact, the techniques of renormalization will help us to resum the logarithms. Okay. 
So let me go further with the with the with the EFT and renormalization concepts. So the first thing um, one does is actually to do the dimensional analysis in in natural units. So in natural units, everything can be expressed in terms of the energy scale. The the length and time are just the inverse energy. So for example, the action doesn't have a, a unit. Uh, so th these are the, the, these basic relations from, uh, from, from dimensional analysis, which means that Lagrangian density in four dimensions has a unit of energy to the power of four. So from the three Lagrangians, you can figure out the dimension of every field. For example, scalar and vector fields have the dimension one. The fermionic fields have dimension three halves. And the cross section, the cross section is the is cross section is the is the length square, which means um, uh, energy to minus two. And the decay rate is the inverse in inverse time, right? The decay rate is the inverse time, so this is energy. So let's just do some simple um, dimensional anal analysis. You imagine you have phi cube interaction. So the, the coupling of this interaction is dimension full. Remember Lagrangian is dimension four. The field is dimension one. So the coupling mu has dimension um, one, okay? Now you are, you're calculating cross section, two to two scattering. You see that you have two insertions of the coupling. So it goes mu square at the level of amplitude and this squared at the level of cross section. So mu to the four. And imagine that these guys are very light and you are scattering at energies that are much uh, bigger than their mass. So the only relevant scale in your problem is, the, is this S, which is the center of mass energy. Just by the dimensional analysis to match the units between cross section and the, 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 the right hand side, you get that this thing goes as one over S cube. Okay. So it is very enhanced at low energies and it, it gets very much, very quickly suppressed at high energies. So example two <coughs> is phi to the four theory. Here, if you do the, 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 the end naive dimensional analysis, you get that the cross section goes as lambda square over S. So here you still have enhancement at low energies and uh, suppression at high energies, but it's not as dramatic as in the case of uh, as in the case of the example one. Okay. And finally, the, the third example is G uh, psi bar psi square. So, what is the unit of G here? Remember that the, the field psi has a dimension of three halves. It's written over here. So three half square is three and uh, squared, sorry, not squared, three half um, times uh, two and times two, okay. So the unit of psi bar psi square is uh, six. And in order to get four, which is the unit of Lagrangian density or Lagrangian, um, G has to have a unit minus two. All right. So if you are looking at this two to two scattering, um, at the level of amplitude, we have one coupling G, but then it gets squared for the cross section. So it's G squared. And now we want to, um, now we want to match the, the, the unit of the cross section, which is minus two. So it means that we have a linear coupling. So it linear dependence on S, S is energy squared. So you see that effective, this interaction in example three behaves very differently from the first two. It's in fact small suppressed at low energies and enhanced, it's big at high energies. Okay. And this has to do with the, with the, the, the classification of operators under renormalization. So there are 
three classes of operators, depending on the dimension, on the, on the, on the, on the dim canonical dimension of the, of the operator. These are relevant, which have dimensions smaller than four. Uh, four is the, 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 the number of space-time uh, space dimensions. So these are, for example, phi square, phi cube, or psi bar psi, which have dimensions two, three, three. And these are actually enhanced at low energies. Okay, as we saw in example one, these belong to the example one. Then there are marginal operators, for example, like phi to the four or, or vector interaction to the uh, fermionic bilinear or, or Yukawa interaction. These are marginal uh, and, and they belong to the example two. And then finally, there are irrelevant operators and these are higher dimensional operators. These are called irrelevant simply because that at low energies, they belong to example three, which I showed, they, they, they become irrelevant. That's, that's the name. So there is a line between these, uh, between relevant and marginal and irrelevant. The first category are renormalizable operators. They, uh, they, and, and the second category are so-called non-renormalizable operators. For example, the standard model is a renormalizable theory and it only contains operators from the first two classes. Okay. So what, what does this, uh, the, uh, what does this mean? Um, so what, what is the pro, what is what people thought initially is the problem with non-renormalizable operators? So, well, people thought initially that they are, that these are not, not predictive theories. Why? So, so take, take, for example, dimension six operator and you want to calculate loop. Remember, remember the normalization is about loops. So this loop has a divergence and you see that this guy has eight external legs. So to cancel this divergence, you need a counter term. So you have to introduce dimension eight operator with eight legs. So you need a, to cancel divergence, you need a counter term. Now, now you have dimension eight operator. You can close the loop and get dimension 10, et cetera. And you can move on and, uh, and then you see that you basically need infinitely many counter terms. Counter terms are um, additional parameters you introduce um, to, to, to cure the divergences. So if you need infinitely many new parameters in your theory, then your theory is clearly not predictive. Okay. Okay, so that, that, that's what people thought initially with non-renormalizable operators, that they are problematic. However, there is a catch. If you are doing calculations uh, where the EFT is valid, namely uh, at low energies, at, at, in, in, the, in the region where, uh, you know, where, where the power counting works, okay? Where energy is smaller than the, the, so the soft scale and hard scale are separated. Then you are truncating your series, okay? The, the, you are doing power counting. So the divergence is higher order in power counting. So you can see, for example, in this diagram, the first diagram, you are putting, uh, you, you have dimension six operator but you are inserting it twice. And this effect is dimension eight effect. And this is neglected, okay? This is neglected you, uh, because you, you are truncating your series in, in the, in the, uh, at that level. For example, this is not enough to match the precision of your um, experiment. Maybe your experiment is very, very precise. Okay, you go to dimension eight, you include all dimension eight uh, terms, but there is really a consistent procedure. You have more, more couplings to, to, the, to fit from data, but it's a finite number. It's always a finite number. Do, do, so do, uh, that's the point. It's always a finite number. So you when you decide on the precision you achieve, there is always a finite number of terms you need to, to, um, to, to take into a con consideration. So effective theory is actually as good as renormalizable theory. Actually, every renormalized theory is an effective theory. 
so when you are doing renormalization, even in, in, in uh, with marginal and uh, and irrelevant operators, uh, you are you, when you are shifting the scale, well, what I call this uh, renormalization scale, you are basically transferring modes from uh, soft to hard and vice versa. And this this re re changes your 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 couplings. Imagine at the Planck scale, we have the standard model Lagrangian, and we have all the um, higher dimensional operators or all irrelevant operators. Okay. When you go when you do experiment at low energies, you, the effect of these guys is basically negligible. So they are suppressed by the Planck scale because of the renormalization flow. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the effective field theory is a very powerful tool. There, really, there is a procedure to, to connect low energy observables with high energy UV theories beyond the standard model. It's really a tool. So if you are working beyond the standard model physics, it's really a tool that um, in particular in connection with the, uh, you, you are doing phenomenology, um, you really have to learn this tool, how it, how it works. So there is a matching of a UV theory on SMEFT, then there is a renormalization group running, then matching on weak effective theory, et cetera. There are these steps of running and matching. And uh, um, so for example, if you want to connect some B meson decays to your UV theory, you have to know how to use this, uh, this, uh, this tool of, uh, of effective theory. All right, so I will stop here and um, we can have um, a 10 minutes break. Is it fine? Any questions regarding the first uh, lecture? Please go ahead. Hi, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Um, sorry, uh, there was this part where you were explaining about um, the, the example three where it got suppressed, the, the reaction, the, the process. Yes. Um, I actually, I was still catching up with all this previous stuff and I, I got mixed up a bit. If you wouldn't mind explaining it again. All right, oh sure. Yes, Absolutely. Thanks. Let me just uh, uh, stop sharing the screen and do it again, share, right. So you can see the screen now, right? Yes. Okay, all right, all right. So the, the fermionic field has the dimension of three halves and then, um, then, it, then this example of three so I'm first counting the dimension of G based on, I know that the Lagrangian has a dimension of four and every field inside has a dimension of three halves. Then the, the coupling G has a dimension of minus two, okay? And then when you are, you are doing this scattering, the amplitude, so there are two things. The one is amplitude and the other one is cross section. The amplitude ha has one, one coupling G, but the cross section, the probability is the square of the amplitude and it's G squared. So then to match the cross section for the, to match the dimension of the cross section, one needs, uh, and there is only one scale, which is the energy of the collision. Then you get G squared S. Is that part clear? Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and then you can see that there is different behavior between marginal and irrelevant operators on the left, or, sorry, relevant operators on the example one and two compared to uh, higher dimensional uh, or irrelevant operators in the EFT. All right. So here I would like to give a, um, an explicit, show you an explicit calculations of the, of the real life uh, example that we usually uh, do in, in this business. So it's, um, it's related to, to a B meson decay to D meson and a pion. It's, uh, it's um, so, so a B meson is a bound state. It's a, 
a QCD bound state of, um, of a D quark and a B quark. The D meson is a D quark and charm and pion has up and down quark. So, so the, this decay, it's, it's, it's a hadronic decay of a B meson. It's interesting um, because it, it's related to the, to the CKM element VCB and the underlying quark level transition is a, a B quark going to a charm quark up and down, okay? So we are after this transition at the quark level. And we will, uh, we will here consider only the, the, the perturbative part of the calculation, which come from short distances, hence from high energies, including the, the leading QCD corrections, which, which will turn out to be very important. So I, I should also say that there, there is a non-perturbative dynamics playing non-perturbative non matrix elements, which go into this calculation. Uh, which also give high uncertainties. But at the moment, we will just consider the perturbative part. Okay, so let, let me recap the, one of the points that I tried to make in the previous uh, hour. So the, the QCD correction, so this, this is the diagram with the exchange of the W. So this transition bottom to charm up down goes through the exchange of a weak boson W. Now, exchanging a gluon will give you this kind of diagram. This is a box, one loop box diagram. <clears throat> and we already seen something similar to this, not exactly this, but something similar to this. And we know that, that there, will be, um, there will be terms which will go as the logarithm of the, of, uh, MW, which is the W mass over MB, which is the bottom quark mass. And if you, so this will be alpha S logari logarithm of this. And higher loops will also have these terms to the power of the loop, okay? So you will have alpha S log to the power of N for N loop. So you see, you have to calculate, and this thing is big. This is a 0.7. It's not extremely big, okay? It's not like you are, uh, uh, but, but it's ra rather big. And you have, to, you have to calculate in e at every loop for e each loop order. So there are in infinite, infinitely many loop orders. You have to resum all the, all the diagrams. Um, you, you have to isolate this piece, which goes as, uh, as the, the logarithm. So you have to reorganize your perturbation series. series. And this is done by effective field theory, matching and running, okay. So you see, if you were to calculate in the full theory, you do one loop and then you add two loop and you see this, uh, this big parameter, it would be a large correction and then three loop and, and so on. It would be very, very poorly converging series. So the, the effective theory will help us to solve this problem. Okay. Um, so the, the, the UV theory is the standard model in this case, and the effective theory is a weak, weak effective uh, Lagrangian, so, or, or the four Fermi, on, four Fermi, um, uh, Fermi theory. So the matching is to integrate out the W and, uh, and integrate out the W and determine the Wilson coefficients, that will be the matching part. And the running part will be to run down from the mass of the W to mass of B. Okay. So this is the, the, the Lagrangian for the effective theory. The first part is the electromagnetic uh, um, uh, kinetic term. The second part is the, the gluon kinetic term. Um, the third part is the, is the kinetic term for the, for the quark fields. D is the covariant derivative, which contains the interaction, the QCD interaction we need. And then there are effective interactions, higher dimensional or irrelevant operators. The, the one that we need, <laughs> the relevant operator, sorry, the, the irrelevant operators are O1 and O2. 
within the brackets, you have the contraction between, uh, for example, the color contraction and the Lorentz contraction. So the brackets are basically singlets of everything. Okay. Within the brackets is the singlet of everything. So O1 is, is when charm talks to B and O2 is when charm talk, talks to up quark. Okay. And this, so this is just the definition of the operators. Uh, uh, they are local, every field depends on the same X. CN is the Wilson coefficient, which, will, which we, we have to find, we have to match. And mu is the renormalization scale. C1 and C2 are the relevant Wilson coefficients. Okay, so now, um, now let's do the three level matching. In the three level, you exchange W and yeah, so, so you put different factors for the vertex. Um, you have a one current, the other current, and you put the propagator. So the propagator for the W. So at three level, the, the, we, it's, it's a very simple calculation. So you just neglect the, the P square. P square is the energy uh, of the, in the decay. Uh, so the, the, you approximate the propagator of the, of the W with one over M square. And then, so you're basically matching the, the, this amplitude in full theory to this one, the local one in, 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 the in the effective theory. And then you require them to be the same when the momenta are small. And then you can read off the Wilson, the Wilson coefficients. In particular, the, um, the C1, which was uh, related to O1, okay, is expressed in terms of G Fermi and the CK matrix elements. And C2 is zero at three level. C2 Wilson coefficient, which was charm up down B, it is zero at three level. Okay. So this three level calculation is, so, is very simple. All right, but now let's uh, do the, the one loop matching. One loop matching. So at one loop, what do we have to do? So we have to calculate uh, one loop in alpha strong. So the, 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 the QCD coupling, we have to calculate the, di the, the loop correction both in the UV theory and in the EFT, okay? And match those, those matrix elements. So this is, these are the full set of diagrams in the UV theory. So you can see, so we are exchanging gluons between different, uh, different legs. So you can see that we have, there are basically six different diagrams, how you can attach gluons to different legs. And in particular, the first four diagrams are uh, finite do not have a UV divergence. The, the, these two, which are the vertex corrections, they, they are uh, infinite, they have a divergence. So this divergence has to be cured by a counter term. So in, in UV theory, there is a counter term for the vertex of W. So we add a counter term diagram. Uh, so, so this is the full set of relevant diagrams. Okay. What about effective theory? In effective theory, uh, we are inserting the local interactions. Now we have these, o, um, the, these O1 and O2 operators, which are these local interactions. And we are dressing with the gluon field. And we are drawing all possible one loop diagrams, which are similar to the previous case. And some of these are divergent, for example, E and uh, yeah, I think uh, all of them, all of them, yes, I suppose. And the, um, the counter term is, the, is this counter term, it's just dimension six. Um, um, at this level, oh, we just need one counter term. 
to, to cancel these divergences. Okay, so let's just do the, the calculation. So let's take the diagram A from the UV, calcul UV, calcula UV diagrams. So it was this diagram here. Perhaps I just, do, do you see it enlarged? Yes. Okay, so it's this diagram. So it's a, you know, there is a, a W, there is a gluon, and then there are, so there are four propagators um, in the loop. Okay, so yeah. So you do, the, let's say, dimensional regularization to reg regulate the, the, the divergence. Uh, so it's, it's DIMREG, dimensional regularization. Um, and yes, so you put different pieces, Feynman rules. So the, there, is a, there are four different propagators. So the, the, the gluon, the W, and then there is a, one fermion and the other fermion. And that's the, that is the loop, that's the diagram. Okay, so now you have to massage this, and, and these are all these techniques that um, uh, one, one should sit down and, and uh, do, do. So the, so the, first of all, you have to do the reduction of the scalar integral. For example, there is this uh, tensor structure in the numerator K alpha K beta, which you can replace by this, uh, this term with G alpha beta. And you can simplify the integral to this form, which is shown in the second line. So you are doing some, uh, yes. So this K slash, in K slash, you are transforming into this by this relation. Now you have a simpler uh, integral, which you, you can solve. So this one over K to the four K squared minus M, MW squared. So this integral is finite, is UV finite, but it is infrared divergent. So have a look at this integral. So in the denominator, it has many powers of K, meaning that, uh, um, meaning that it is well behaved at, at high energies where, where K is big. So the, the integral is uh, uh, the UV finite. At low energies, the, the, the first term blows up. When k goes to zero, the, the, so there is infrared singularity. <clears throat> so here we are we are simplifying calculation. We are neglecting the masses of the of the external quarks. If we didn't do that, we would have to put uh, the mass of the bottom, the mass of charm, etc., and that would be infrared regulator. But here we are ne neg neglecting that. <clears throat> uh, because we are doing so, so we are we are interested in the in the the effects of the W of the of the hard scale. Okay, so the this integral is infrared divergent, but UV finite, and you can calculate this um, integral in uh, um, there are formulas for the that this is solved in the literature, and you get this this piece. So you can see that the, the graph has one over epsilon IR. This is the infrared divergence. One technical thing is that the, in, 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 in DIMREG, you have this distinction between uh, UV and IR uh, um, uh, epsilons. And uh, yeah, so then, then you have to massage the, 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 the the Dirac, so, so you have to massage the, the currents. You see that the, you, got, you got some operators which are not really O1 and O2. So you have to massage them. And so you can use the color, color algebra and the spin algebra, meaning Fields identities. For example, the color algebra is this relation, okay. So you can express that these are the generators of color. You can express them uh, on, in terms of uh, of different um, uh, of different connections between different color indices. And the other, then there are fields identities. So these are these are just basically Lorentz symmetry. Okay. 
and plus mi and minus for fermion fields for anti-commutation for quantizations. For the, the, this is for no, in this case, this is just spinners, so you don't need. Uh, Anyway, so you have the color and spin algebra and uh, you can massage this term and then you can get this, this diagram. Okay. So this is the, the, the final formula for diagram A. So you have the, this logarithm of mu tilde over MW squared. Mu tilde is this uh, scale, this arbitrary scale, which comes out from the dim reg, just, just the, uh, the this spurious scale, which comes uh, from the fact that we are going into um, into lower number in, in d dimensions, and then to match the dimensions, you have this you need to do this spurious scale, which actually is very useful um, uh, tool later on. It will bring us to renormalization group, etc. But for the moment, we did we massage the thing and we separated it into O1 and O2. So I'm not going to do every diagram. Uh, I'm uh, so this is the sum of the A, B, and C diagrams, uh, which are the, which are in the UV theory, which are this upper row, this box basically diagrams, uh, and they are UV finite but infrared divergent. So then, then you get this something like this. They are very similar to the diagram A. Uh, so this is O1 and this is O2. N is the number of color, so it's one over three. Yes, okay. So now we have to calculate diagram E and F. So what was it? E and F were these two diagrams. So they are vertex corrections uh, and these are their counter terms. So these diagrams will be um, UV divergent. So they will have the, they, they will be a UV divergent. So if you do it in, in the, in the, in the uh, MS bar, sorry, in MS bar. So you are doing it in, in you are doing it in DIMREG. It's important to separate the UV and the IR. The, the, otherwise, because this is a scaleless integral, scaleless integral, the, the two would cancel if you equate them. So you separate the UV and the IR, and they basically match on, on, on O1, the, these two guys. Uh, okay. So then how do you do the 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 uh, the how do you remove the divergence? So you have these counter term diagrams, and then you fix the counter term by MS bar in MS bar scheme. That means just taking uh, some part of the divergence. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a renormalization scheme, and then you then then this is done in in this equation three one one zero six. All right, so what is the final theory result? You have to sum up all the diagrams, including the counter terms, and then you cancel the, the, the UV divergence. So your amplitude is UV finite. However, it still has the, the infrared divergence. So why, 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 why is this so? Well, the, this is really a physical divergence. I mean, um, we made this approximation that the mass of, of quarks is neg zero, is ne negligible. But in fact, if you are calculating this decay, you would put, um, you would put things like MB, et cetera. So what, ha what happens is that these one over epsilon IR terms basically are logarithms of let's say P square over MW square. P square being the bottom mass, for instance. And it is these logarithms which we are trying to uh, resum. They are big, okay? Through an effective theory. So um, this is the full result in the, in, the, in the UV theory. We got the expression which has the infrared singularity because we are neglecting the, the masses. 
And now let's do the EFT calculation. All right, so this is the, uh, the EFT diagram number A. So let's go back. Which one was that? So this is the EFT calculation. So this is A. So you have a, um, right. So it's a, you have this uh, loop here with, with, with the glue on. So this is the diagram we are trying to calculate. Um, all right, so it's here. <clears throat> so you have this one over K to the four. Um, we, we are assuming, so we are putting all the external guys uh, to be it's to be massless. And then we have uh, basically such an arrangement of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the momenta flowing in the loop. In fact, this is scaleless integral. There are no scales in this in integral. I mean, uh, and it's much simpler than the other one, okay? So there are contributions both from C1 and C2. C1 and C2 being the different Wilson coefficients for the two operators. So, okay, let me go back and ask you, uh, do you understand why there are no things in here? Like wh why the propagators have no scale? Is it clear in this diagram? In this loop? Uh, so we, because I'm, neg I'm neglecting, so, so this is a C quark here. These are quarks. And I'm neglecting quark masses. They, they are very small compared oh, to the see. MW. And this is a gluon and gluon is massless. So there are three propagators. And uh, so, so the propagator is one over K square minus M square and all these masses are neglected. All right, so yeah, so this integral is very simple to calculate in dim, in dim reg. It, it has no scale. So it will be the, the difference between the UV and IR divergence. And, and it has this form, very simple. Um, so we had to massage at this point, we had to do, do the same color and spin massaging of, the, of, the, of these operators in the, in the, in, 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 in the product. So now we are in position to some old diagrams. The other diagrams are similar to the diagram A. And this is the final result. So you can see that this is divergent. So we need to remove the UV divergence by the counter term diagram. So this is the counter term diagram. Um, yeah, so how, how did we get this? Well, it's, it's MS bar renormalization scheme, which means uh, a certain prescription how to remove the divergence. And uh, when you sum up MG and this, this amplitude up there, you don't have any more uh, the UV divergence. That's how this, this, this was uh, engineered, okay? So when you sum up the two, this is what you get. This is the effective, this is the matrix element uh, of an effective theory up to order alpha S. In terms of the Wilson coefficients, this is operator O1 and this is operator O2. So now you can see that both results, I hope I put them uh, together. So this is the full result. And this is the DFT result. The both results have infrared singularity. Okay. But the point is that they have the, the, the same in a way. We can choose as we can choose Wilson coefficient C1 and C2. So when we match the two, so we say they are they are equal. The, the matching means that this matrix element is equal to the other one. And then uh, we figure out what the Wilson coefficients are, C1 and C2. And we can uh, find C1 and C2, which they do not depend on the, on the infrared uh, regulator. So you see, if you choose C1, which depends only on G and on uh, alpha strong, MW, okay? 
and and the renormalization scale, of course, then you don't have uh, then then they don't depend on the infrared regulator. This is actually a very important check of your calculations. That that. Um, that the infrared singularity, um, that infrared singularity in the UV theory and matches the one in the low energy theory. What does this mean? So, you know, it means that the two theories are equal at infrared at low at low energies. <clears throat> so uh, let me read this very carefully. The note that Wilson coefficients are infrared finite. They do not depend on the epsilon IR. In other words, the infrared divergent term from loops in the full theory are reproduced exactly by loops in effective theory. This cancellation is self-consistency of the, it is the check of the, of the calculation. As long as we are only integrating out heavy fields, for example, W, infrared divergences should cancel in the matching, okay? If they didn't, it would mean that infrared degrees of freedom are different in the two theories. And we have not just integrated out short distance physics. Is this subtle uh, uh, thing of cancellation of infrared divergence is clear? Basically, we could choose Wilson coefficients to match the two amplitudes. Um, in such a way that they don't depend on the infrared regulator. Um, so, okay, there's a question. If the infrared divergence will always cancel in the matching, why do we need to compute them in the first place? But we have to get the formula for the Wilson coefficients and along the way, we, 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 this is actually the cross check of this calculation. So we, we went out there to calculate C1 and C2 in terms of MW, alpha strong and G. And we had to do calculations uh, both in the EFT and in, in the UV. And then we saw that the, the, the infrared uh, behavior of the two is the same. Um, so, so now let's, let's look at the, the the formula. Now we can choose this. So this this scale mu, this scale which comes from dimensional regularization. It's a dummy scale. I mean, it's just introduced uh, to match the dimensions. We have freedom to choose it. So clearly, we will choose this scale to be MW, because we then we don't have a large logarithm. This is the matching scale, the so-called matching scale. We can, um, we, we will choose it in such a way to minimize the, log, the logarithm. And then we are basically determining the Wilson coefficients at MW. So it's the value of the Wilson coefficient at MW, if we set the matching scale to be MW. But we are interested in the value of this coupling, not at that scale, but at the scale of the B mass of the B quark. So we so matching is not the only thing. We have to do the, the running. So what does running mean? So so this is the renormalization of these operators. So how does it work? Um, so you have the Lagrangian and you have these operators. So now you you have you are to do renormalization, we introduce the 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 the, the, the renormalization con, con Z1. And Z2, uh, C1 and C2 are these uh, renormalized. Uh, C1 and C2 are renormalized Wilson coefficients. O1 and O2 are renormalized operators. Renormalized operators which depend on renormalized fields. So uh, we can actually fix Z1 and Z2. These are basically renormalizations of the of the renormalization of the of the Wilson coefficient. We can fix them from the counter term diagram. Remember that we had we already calculated the counter term diagrams. Where was it? It's this thing here. So this is the counter term diagram. This is renormalized, renormalized, and so so there is this uh, UV divergence. So from here we can literally read off 
the the constants the renormalization constants of the c1 and c2 and it's it, they are given by this formula z1 and z2 okay so again uh, z1 and z2 we want to renormalize so what how do you renormalize so you have a lagrangian it has terms what what can you what how where can you hi hide your infinities you can find them in the fields or in the couplings or in the masses so uh, so we are taking one one renormalization constant for the coupling c1 the other one for coupling c2 and we are also uh, doing the renormalization of the fields so every field inside these operators these operators are renormalized fields. So this really looks like a counter term. So that is why we can just read it off from the top diagrams. Now to get to RGE, to, uh, the, the, the running group evolution, what do we have to do? So we have to express the renormalized operator in terms of the bare fields. So each of the fields of the quark fields gets renormalized under uh, QCD. So these are the the the, Z, the zip two the renormalization uh, field field strength normalization, and and you remember that it goes as a square root of z. So there is one over z square in here, okay. And and this is well known in in QCD when you calculate the the, the, the in Feynman gauge for instance the z two um, z two uh, field renormalization has this formula. Okay, so there is also the, uh, so we are working them as bar and uh, there is also better function for the, the alpha strong, which will be important. And we uh, come- sorry. Uh, yes? May I just ask one question? So uh, all the four uh, fermionic fields have the same renormalization constant, right? Yes, yes. They are massless and uh, yes, this is a wave function renormalization, yes. QCD uh, doesn't distinct, distinguish between any of those. Ah, okay, okay, and then as the result, okay, okay. But, but the important lo logic here is that in this equation, uh, 115, the operators are renormalized. And this is basically the counter term, the, uh, the counter term uh, Feynman rule. They are renormalized here. And therefore we could get Z1 and Z2 from, from the previous uh, calculation. But now we, we are expressing the renormalized operator in terms of bare fields. And then we get this quark field strength renormalization from QCD, just, just the QCD. These are the diagrams. These are the, the, the two point diagram, like the, the dressing of the quark propagator with the gluon field. I'm pretty sure you did this calculation when you did the beta function uh, in, in some uh, QCD class or something. <clears throat> All right, so what, how do we get renormalization group equation? So the, the, the idea is that bare coupling does not depend on uh, the bare coupling. So the, the, the bare does not depend on mu. Mu is this uh, dummy scale which was introduced by Dimrek. So what is the bare coupling? So it's basically, if you write O1 in terms of bare operator, there will be C1, Z1 over Z square, where Z2 comes from the, and then you will have just bare fields. So that thing in front of that does not depend on, on, the, on, the, on mu, on the scale mu. So what does that mean? The bare coupling does not depend on mu. It means that, uh, uh, you, you can just write the RG, so, so the derivative over mu is zero, okay. And then you separate different terms. You put the Wilson coefficient on the left side and the rest, um, um, so what will happen? So you have these formulas, you call, collect them. And uh, the, at order alpha S, the, the, the epsilon will go away and you will get essentially uh, basically, you get this, and this is uh, the, the renormalization group equation for the Wilson coefficients. So it's a differential equation. It's a couple different, there are two equations. They are coupled to each other for C1 and C2. 
it's uh, it's first order uh, differential equation. So d over d mu ci are Wilson coefficients, which depend on the mu on the scale mu. And notice that this thing, which multiplies, so it's a homogeneous equation. This thing, which multiplies uh, um, on the, on the right hand side, this is called the, uh, the anomalous dimension. Okay, gamma ij. And you see that it has off diagonal terms, which is very interesting. These off diagonal terms mean uh, that there is the so-called operator mixing, meaning that if even if you set one operator to zero at some scale, quantum corrections will generate it. So you have to include all the all the all the relevant operators. Uh, there, there is a cute uh, symmetry. Uh, then there is a, so, so there is the isospin. Um, so you have to, how do you solve this RG? You have to diagonalize this matrix and you have to redefine the operator. So now you have O0 and one O3. So again, because QCD doesn't dis distinguish between different quark flavors, um, then the symmetry comes about. The only breaking is via, via mass, which we are neglecting. So you have a, you have a singlet and a triplet. Anyways, one combination is a singlet. The other one is the triplet of isospin. So these are irreducible representation of the global symmetry of the, of the accidental symmetry in this calculation. And, and, and therefore they do not mix under renormalization. So different, different irreducible representations do not mix. They, they run, run with the different, uh, uh, this is just the interpretation of these equations with the different anomalous dimensions. Anyways, that just, uh, if you don't care about this story, you just solve the equations and you can get the Wilson coefficient at any scale mu in terms of the Wilson coefficient at MW. This is what we wanted. So we did the matching at MW and we want to have the, the, the Wilson coefficient at a different mu, mu smaller than MW. So you just have to, uh, yeah, it's a very simple equation. They, they get decoupled when you diagonalize and you get exponent of the, yes. It, it usually has this form, is the exponent of the integral over the, over the uh, alpha, over the coupling uh, constant of the ratio of uh, anomalous dimension over the beta function, okay. Yes, and then you can, um, Yes, put some numbers. And for example, th this is interesting. Remember that this, uh, so C1 at three level, it was one, it was just G. Now it get corrected by, by 8%, okay, at MB. But remember C2, C2 was zero and now it's 0.2. Uh, this gets it was zero at three level and it gets large correction. Uh, so what's important? So the renormalization group equations they resum the logs. So in the matching we chose the uh, the scale mu to be equal m w to have small logs, but then we ended up with Wilson coefficients at that scale. We want to go to 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 a different scale. And, and there uh, we solve the, this RG. This RG basically uh, with this exponentiation. So the solution of this RG, uh, they, they resum the large logs in all, uh, at all orders in alpha strong basically. That's it. I think my, my time is up. I just want to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm working, I have some work in progress where we are looking in, in, the, in the same uh, decay B to, B to D pi um, in new physics. So in the standard model effective field theory, that was in the standard model, this calculation. In standard model effective field theory, there are many, many more operators, but the, the, the technology you use is pretty much the same as, as in here. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay, I would, if you have time, I would suggest you to go through this calculation carefully. I think it's very instructive. Um, there, there, there are many little details that, that are relevant um, for standard model effective field theory, for instance. Um, 
that you you can learn by, by working out this example in in uh, it's basically taken from the book uh, schwartz quantum field theory of schwartz all right i would stop here and see you next time when we will talk about uh what was it Fla flavor or something Okay. Thank you, Admir. Thank you very much, guys.